Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar entitled The Steroidogenic Pathway, Understanding What Influences Each Step. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Ellen Antoine. My name is Christine Stubbe and I am a medical education specialist at Genova's Asheville branch. I am going to serve as the moderator for today's webinar. We would like to welcome Dr. Ellen Antoine. Dr. Antoine completed her residency in emergency medicine at Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She received her medical degree from Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine and her Bachelor of Science degree in biology from Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana. Dr. Ellen Antoine is duly board certified in emergency medicine and integrative holistic medicine. She was one of the first 100 practitioners to be certified in functional medicine by the Institute for Functional Medicine. Her extensive, extensive knowledge of functional and integrative medicine combined with years of experience practicing acute care medicine, in addition to her own family's personal health journey, has provided her with the unique ability to bring this type of comprehensive medical care geared at addressing underlying root issues to others. Dr. Antoine is committed to and passionate about partnering with her patients on their journey to optimal wellness. Her goal is to empower others with the knowledge of how to best care for their own bodies so that they can live fully functional and thrive in the midst of complex and chronic illness. She is just as passionate about educating other practitioners in how to have fully functional medical practices and renew their love for patient care. Dr. Ellen Antoine currently lives in Carmel, Indiana with her husband, Dr. Scott Antoine, and their five children where they co-own Vine Healthcare, a functional integrative medicine clinic in downtown Carmel. One of the most common questions we get asked during the webinar is about availability of this presentation in the slide deck. These materials will be available on our website within a week of the webinar. If you are interested in having these resources, please click the Learn Now link on the homepage where you will find access to our webinars, or you can also log in to find the webinars on your MyGDX account. If you do not have a MyGDX account, please click on the Getting Started link on our homepage. All right, and so now, Dr. Antoine, I'm gonna turn the controls over to you and we should be good to go here. Thanks for having me, everybody. I'm excited to be here. We've got quite a bit of information to get through today. And so um, I just want to go through what we're going to be learning. Today we're going to be talking about, obviously, the steroidogenic cascade. Um, we'll be talking about all of the enzymes involved and what influences them positively and negatively. And then at the end of this uh, presentation, we'll be able to go through some cases and see how we apply all this information in our clinical practices. Okay, so um, just to go through a few little housekeeping things on my end, I do like to say that you know the suggestions in this webinar in terms of treatments are really just that, suggestions, and they're really just for educational purposes. They're based on my own research as well as my own anecdotal experience with patients. Um, they're not necessarily things that you would, uh, that I would recommend for all patients, and I'm sure most, if not all, of you are aware that we take things on a case-by-case -case basis. Everybody's an individual patient. Um, and so you should be using your own judgment when treating your own patients and obviously looking for root causes of disease. Okay, so going through a few of the basics. No two patients are alike, so it is going to be individualized treatment when you're looking at your patients. And I think a really important thing to know and keep in mind is that hormones don't function in isolation. That's the importance of understanding this um, cascade, that we need to understand how they impact one another. And ultimately, how these enzymes work and the metabolic pathways that the hormones take is really going to be um, what determines their ultimate effects in our bodies. When I am seeing patients, or my husband and I are seeing patients in our um, practice, we 
aren't always getting hormone assessments on every patient that walks through the doors. So what we're trying to decide is which patients are going to benefit most from these types of uh, hormone analyses. Um, so the most common patients that we see that we'd be ordering hormone testing on would be what you see listed here, um, patients certainly with obvious hormone complaints, but then you want to think about things like fatigue or even heart disease or cancer, um, people having sleep troubles, even migraine headaches. Um, one of the things that I left off of this list, patients with acne are another thing that we see in our patients um, where we'd be considering getting hormone testing on them. Okay, so here is the steroidogenic cascade. And I will tell you, Christine told you I started my career in emergency medicine. And to be honest with you, in emergency medicine, I didn't care or know or even realize all of this uh, was going on with our hormones. I, I just wanted to know if somebody was pregnant or not or if they were in adrenal crisis or not. I didn't care about all of these metabolites or really understand them. So. When I started my training in functional medicine, I was really um, intimidated and overwhelmed when uh, this popped up on one of the screens. And my goal here today is really, um, if you feel intimidated by looking at this, that hopefully by the end of this lecture, you'll be less intimidated, that you'll have some um, you know, understanding that you didn't have before. It is overwhelming. There's a lot of information here, but it definitely is something that you will uh, hopefully gain some insights through today. So I want to break it down a little bit. One of the things that I absolutely love to do with my patients is I love word pictures and I love analogies. And I actually pull up the steroidogenic pathway. I have it printed out. And when I'm talking with patients that I'm measuring hormones on, I actually pull it up and I show it to them. And I, I like to describe um, the hormone pathways, I kind of split it up into two categories. I say we've got our stress hormones on this side of the uh, pathway over here, and then we've got our sex hormones over here. And I describe it to my patients like this. We've got two bank accounts. Um, stress hormone, particularly cortisol probably being the most important when I'm talking with my patients, is necessary for life. So I describe it as a bank account that is your survival bank account. This is, the, this is what your body requires to live off of and pay all your bills, if you will. The sex hormones over on this side of the pathway, for the most part, um, are more like play money or entertainment money. We can't live without cortisol, we'll die, but men can win, live without their testicles, women can live without their ovaries, although I tell my patients that many would feel like they want to die, but they can survive without them. Um, so in simplified terms, we've got the must-have bank account and we've got the entertainment money uh, bank account where it's not necessary for life. Probably a common term um, that you've heard of is pregnenolone steel, or some people refer to it as progesterone steel, or even cortisol steel. And this is where I describe to my patients that under um, times of ongoing persistent stress, the demand for cortisol in the body is high. We have 24 hours a day, we're making cortisol, but we, you know, we make it in a circadian uh, diurnal rhythm where it's highest in the morning, lowest in the evening. But under chronic stress, and we'll talk a little bit about what those stressors are as we get through this, but under chronic stress or what the body perceives as stress, those cortisol uh, levels remain high um, and that demand is high. And so we've got the must-have bank account we need to keep full so we can survive um, versus the money that might be gone over into your entertainment money bank account. And so under chronic stress, what ends up happening is this phenomenon called pregnenolone, steel, cortisol steel, or progesterone steel, whichever you'd like to refer to it as, where we actually steal, if you will, the hormones that would normally go into this enter entertainment uh, bank account into the survival bank account so that we can survive and that we have enough cortisol. The first and rate limiting step in this pathway is the conversion of cholesterol to 
pregnenolone, and it occurs by a single enzyme called a side chain cleavage enzyme, this uh, P450 side chain cleavage enzyme. Um, there are two different types of enzymes in this steroidogenic pathway that are responsible for all the metabolism that takes place. Either they're going to fall into cytochrome P450 enzymes um, or hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase enzymes. And all of these enzymes are modulated by cofactors. So in the metabolism of cholesterol to pregnenolone, um, these require energy. So you can see NADPH is necessary here. And three monooxygenase reactions occur in this entire process. So it's a complicated process. Um, and one of the things that I think is also really important is understanding that we require adequate fat and adequate cholesterol levels in order to make hormones. So cholesterol is that building block of all the steroid hormones. So patients come to me and, and are very familiar with high cholesterol and the concern from perhaps their other providers that they have hyperlipidemia and they need to address that. But very rarely, if ever, do I hear a patient talk about low cholesterol. In fact, they've been told by their providers that you know low cholesterol levels are quite good. But as we can see from understanding this steroid pathway, if we don't have enough cholesterol, we're going to have trouble making hormones. So you need to make sure your patients in their dietary uh, regimen are eating adequate fats and have adequate cholesterol levels. So in those patients that are on uh, statins, if you will, or red yeast rice, any binders, or have genetically low cholesterol, you, need to, you do need to be concerned about their ability to make hormones. And there is quite a bit of literature that does um, demonstrate that low cholesterol levels is definitely associated with an increased risk of cancer, suicide, um, and memory concerns. So um, those are probably related to the hormone deficiencies associated with low cholesterol. Pregnenolone, that, that next step, and actually the first steroid hormone is uh, in this cascade, is primarily made in the adrenal glands. And um, in times of chronic stress, levels drop. We just talked about that. We talked about that pregnenolone steal, if you will. Um, the body's going to steal from other areas in order to make cortisol under times of chronic stress. It is a good marker to identify aging, and it is associated, as found in the literature, to be associated with memory loss and uh, stress-induced fatigue um, can be improved with providing pregnenolone. It also has been shown to improve immunity, um, provide decreased PMS symptoms in patients, and allow us to be more resistant to stress. So again, here's the pathway, and the first thing that we're going to break down is we're going to first look at this 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase enzyme. It's color-coded for you in orange, so it is actually responsible for those three um, orange arrows and the conversion of pregnenolone to progesterone, 17-hydroxypregnenolone to 17-hydroxyprogesterone, and the conversion of DHEA to androstene dione. Now, on that metabolic uh, steroidogenic pathway, we don't have all the metabolites there. So I did want you to know that this particular 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase enzyme is also responsible for the conversion of androstene diol to testosterone and 5-alpha DHT to 5-alpha androstenediol. It is the only enzyme of the adrenal pathway of corticosteroid synthesis that's not part of that cytochrome P450 enzyme. So you're going to see decreased activity of this enzyme in patients that are taking progestins. Um, also can be seen decreased activity in those that are um, taking metformin. And metformin as we'll go into some of these other uh, enzymes, not only decreases the 3-beta-hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase, but also decreases the 17-beta-hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase, which is responsible for the conversion of androstene dione to testosterone. This is why it's a useful medication in those patients with PCOS. Um, 
we see increased activity in the things listed here. We see increased activity of this enzyme in PCOS, in high insulin levels, in uh, interleukin-4, interleukin-13 uh, patients that have higher activity of those uh, uh, um, cytokines, if you will, associated with allergies and an increase in hyperthyroidism, as well as forscolin. And forscolin is, comes from the Indian coleus plant, and it actually increases uh, cyclic AMP, which is responsible for HPA access feedback. So a little bit about progesterone, aside from the enzyme activity, is primarily made in the ovaries, less so in the adrenals, but also made in the testes in men. We see increased levels of progesterone, um, out, again, outside of that enzyme activity in pregnancy. Um, if you do give pregnenolone, alone, you will see increased metabolites, but not actually uh, increased progesterone levels in the blood. And then chase tree berry is interesting. Um, it's not entirely understood. It used to be thought that uh, the effects of chase tree berry uh, Berry were to increase progesterone levels through affecting the pituitary and um, decreasing luteinizing hormone, but actually it looks like the effect may be due to decreasing uh, prolactin levels and thus increasing progesterone levels. You can also see decreased progesterone levels in those patients already taking birth control pills, uh, increased stress, as we talked about, that cortisol steal or otherwise known as progesterone steal. Um, opioids is another interesting one. So opioids don't only affect uh, progesterone, but um, opioids affect lots of diff different receptors and can either stimulate or inhibit those receptors. So studies demonstrate that those patients who take opioids for whatever pain condition they have, you can see increased levels of growth hormone, increased levels of prolactin, increased TSH, while having decreased luteinizing hormone, decreased testosterone, decreased estradiol, and decreased oxytocin. So something to consider in those patients that you have that are on chronic opioid use. The next enzyme that we're going to talk about is the 17-alpha-hydroxylase, and it is responsible for the conversion of pregnenolone to 17-hydroxypregnenolone and progesterone to 17-hydroxyprogesterone. So this enzyme is downregulated, as you see, in those that take spironolactone, um, and spironolactone is otherwise known as aldactone. It also not only affects this enzyme, but it also blocks mineralocorticoid receptors. It also blocks androgen and progesterone receptors. Um, so it's an, an antagonist of androgen receptors. Again, many of us are familiar with using spironolactone in patients with acne or patients with PCOS type pictures, and these would be the reasons why. Azole and antifungals like fluconazole and ketoconazole impact this enzyme activity because they impact cytochrome P450 and decrease activity in the in decreased cytochrome P450 activity, particularly the CYP17 gene, which is the gene responsible for the 17 hydrox 17 alpha hydroxylase enzyme. Most of the time as I was going through this lecture, a lot of the times when we've increased activity, it's often in these patients that are under a lot of stress, have PCOS type a picture, um, have a poor diet, have insulin resistance, uh, alcohol abuse. It's just interesting, the pattern that you'll see here. So we're going to talk about two enzymes next. Um, this is the pathway that's responsible for producing cortisol from 17-hydroxyprogesterone into cortisol, and it requires two enzyme reactions, 21-hydroxylase and 11-beta-hydroxylase. Um, a little bit about cortisol first. Um, cortisol is our stress hormone, produced as our fight-or-flight hormone. It is, as I mentioned, necessary for life. It is involved in gluconeogenesis, so it is a glucocorticoid, um, meaning that you know it's involved in the liver glycogen formation when needed. 
It has anti-inflammatory effects. Of course, it's a steroid, so just like steroids are anti-inflammatory, it does have anti-inflammatory effects, and it does have some anti-diuretic hormone um, type effects as well. So these two enzymes are, as I mentioned, responsible for the conversion to cortisol, and we will see increased conversion to cortisol in those patients that have these uh, conditions. Sodium depletion, high prolactin levels, stress, again, the body's response to stress um, is to make more cortisol. Inflammation is a stressor, so the body's response is to make more cortisol. And also because of its anti-inflammatory effects, the body's responding by making more cortisol. Cushing's is a uh, pituitary issue where we're actually increasing um, production of ACTH, and so ACTH is then going to lead to more cortisol production and obesity. We do see decreased cortisol in patients who are taking steroids. Um, this, these are the patients you have to be worried about who are on chronic steroid use, and all of a sudden they're not on steroids for whatever reason that they have adrenal crisis um, because they're not producing, the body doesn't have that feedback mechanism to continue to produce cortisol, so they end up having uh, an adrenal type crisis because steroids are um, not weaned off properly. Addison's disease is typically an autoimmune condition, but also medications can cause this, where it's really a primary adrenal insufficiency, but you can also get secondary adrenal insufficiency when the pituitary is not making enough ACTH uh, or uh, hypothalamus is not making enough corticotropin releasing hormone. Again, we talked about opioids um, creating a problem in multiple hormones and enzyme activity and receptors. But I also want to talk about chronic marijuana use. Um, I don't see as much here in Indiana because it's not legalized here in Indiana, but in many uh, areas across the country, we've got lots of patients who are using marijuana on a regular basis. And in my research, I put it here under decreased cortisol, but it's, it, there's sort of a mixed picture here. Um, chronic heavy uh, marijuana use can be associated with high levels of cortisol. So while patients say they're, you know, smoking or using marijuana to be relaxed, there's actually studies that demonstrate that cortisol levels are, are um, increased in these patients and actually are having the opposite effect. There's more stress response in the body rather than less. However, in, in what sounds like and looks like long-term heavy chronic uh, marijuana use, ultimately you do see uh, decreased cortisol levels. And then we do see patients that are on Accutane and will have some issues with cortisol as well. The conversion of uh, cortisol to cortisone and cortisone to cortisol um, happens through an enzyme called 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 1 and 2. Um, so Cortisone is actually the inactive or storage form, if you will, of your stress hormone, cortisol, and it has more short-term effect uh, versus cortisol, which has long-term effect. The half-life of cortisol is about three hours, where the half-life of cortisone is about a half an hour. And um, this 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 1 and 2, uh, the, the 1, the 11-beta-hydroxysteroid uh, dehydrogenase 1, is responsible for converting cortisone into cortisol. And um, it is, you, you know, so you're going to have more cortisol when the activity of that dehydrogenase 1 enzyme is increased. And things that are going to increase that enzyme activity are going to be stress inflammation, again, Cushing's disease, obesity, hypothyroidism causes that, licorice, this is one of the things that um, we use in our patients that perhaps have low cortisol levels and we're trying to improve uh, their cortisol levels. Grapefruit has the same impact, um, but also high insulin, again, a stressor to the body, too much sodium, hypoxia, another stressor to the body. Actually, I have vitamin D written down here. It is low vitamin D levels that are associated with uh, increased uh, cortisol production. Again, a stressor to the body. And for scolin, as we mentioned before, it does increase activity by activating, activation of the cyclic AMP. Um, we're going to have more cortisone 
in those patients that actually have less stress typically in their life, although there is more activity in hyperthyroidism, trying to slow the body down somewhat. Um, patients who are on estradiol, we will see more cortisone rather than cortisol. Patients who get actual good quality sleep, have uh, adequate uh, human growth hormone levels, and those typically are measured in, in my practice through insulin growth factor one, insulin-like growth factor one. Um, those patients who have good insulin sensitivity, less inflammation, all of the good things, they have a good balance between cortisone and cortisol. Um, not shown on this uh, steroidogenic pathway is uh, the metabolism of cortisol itself, and I wanted to just touch on this a little bit. Cortisol is metabolized by 5-alpha reductase and 5-beta reductase, as well as the 3-alpha hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase enzyme we talked about before. And it is converted into the alpha and beta tetrahydrocortisol and tetrahydrocortisone uh, for excretion. And so you'll see more of that activity, again, more of those 5-alpha reductase, 5-beta reductase uh, enzyme activity in those patients with obesity and uh, metabolic issues and decreased activity in those with uh, hypothyroidism, anorexia, and poor liver function. This is an example off of, I took a little snapshot off of uh, Genova's complete hormone profile, the 24-hour urine collection. And this is just to give you an example and show you some of this uh, metabolism that's going on. And I think what's interesting here is um, often we measure cortisol levels, whether we're doing a four-point uh, saliva test on somebody or even a 24-hour urine collection of cortisol. If we're not looking at the metabolites, we're missing some important information. If you just look at cortisol level here, you can see it's in the green and maybe a little bit on the lower side, but it's, you know, considered relatively normal. But if you look at the um, enzymes, the alpha tetrahydrocortisol and the uh, tetrahydrocortisone here, as well as the uh, beta, this should be beta tetrahydrocortisol, you can see these metabolites are in the red. They're very high. And this is really indicative of someone who's got ongoing chronic stress. So you might see this picture in someone with obesity, with insulin resistance, or even in hyperthyroidism. So it's important not just to look at cortisol levels alone, but actually to look at the metabolites as well to get a, a more detailed and important picture, as well as understanding these metabolites and understanding there's upregulation of these enzymes uh, occurring as well. And we're going to talk about those enzymes here in a little bit. The next enzyme I want to talk about, and most of us are pretty familiar with, is aromatase. Um, and this enzyme is responsible for the conversion of androstene dione to estrone and the conversion of testosterone to estradiol. And most of us are familiar with this because we talk about our male patients most of the time that have more female features or issues going on. So they, um, you know, may have increased. Um, weight and adipose tissue around the middle. They, um, you know, may have some more irritability. Um, you know, when we're measuring these hormones on them, we're finding higher estrogen uh, levels in them. And so a lot of us are familiar with this, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what we can do to influence this enzyme activity. And it was interesting, um, I, I use a lot of chrysin in my care of my patients, but in going through this study and preparing for you guys, I was pulling up some literature, and I use chrysin because that's what I was taught and trained to do, but I actually couldn't find a lot of literature to support the uh, evidence that chrysin actually decreases this enzyme. Um, I use it. I feel like I've had some good results with it, but I will just tell you, so perhaps chrysin should um, be listed here with a bit of a question mark because I could not find um, evidence in vivo anyway that chrysin did, in, uh, did actually decrease uh, the aromatase activity and thus decrease uh, estrogens in male patients. Um, Zinc has definitely been shown to decrease uh, aromatase activity. Zinc also has been shown to decrease 5-alpha reductase uh, enzyme activity, which we'll talk about in a moment. 
Flaxseed moderately decreases the cytochrome P450 enzyme, you know, the, the aromatase enzyme here, and um, it's a good thing to consider recommending to your patients that they take somewhere between 5 and 30 grams a day of flaxseed if they have no other contraindications to doing so. And that would equal about 1 to 4 tablespoons per day. Other things that will decrease that aromatase activity that you might want to consider in your patients that you're trying to decrease that conversion to estrogens would be stinging nettles, uh, EGCG found in green tea, and then there's prescriptions that do this uh, like anastrozole. Things that do um, increase aromatase activity are going to be, again, those things associated with uh, stress and, and, and poor lifestyle typically. Inflammatory conditions, increased and excess weight, high insulin levels, um, alcohol in excess um, typically, but you know, also just small amounts of alcohol can increase that aromatase uh, enzyme activity. One of the things that my husband Scott and I see a lot in our practice are these patients with biotoxin, you know, often referred to as mold illness. And um, it's not uncommon for us to see, particularly our male patients who have biotoxin illness and chronic inflammatory response syndrome as a result of exposure to water damage buildings, having an increase in this aromatase activity, having relatively low testosterone levels and relatively high uh, estradiol levels. The next enzyme is 5-alpha reductase, and um, again, fairly familiar. Most people are fairly familiar with this enzyme because it's responsible for the conversion of testosterone into dihydrotestosterone, which is really the more potent or the most potent of the uh, and androgens. It's also, though, responsible for metabolizing progesterone into uh, alpha pregnenediol and also for metabolizing, as we already mentioned, cortisol into the alpha tetrahydrocortisol uh, metabolite. And the, the beta metabolite is, um, of the cortisol is through the 5-beta reductase activity. So when we have increased 5-alpha reductase enzyme activity, we're going to see things that look more high androgen male feature symptoms. Men with thinning hair I usually say, Hair loss where you don't want it and hair where you don't want it. So men with balding and then hair on their backs uh, where they don't necessarily want it. It is associated with prostate issues. Um, there is this concern that perhaps 5-alpha uh, reductase enzyme activity uh, with increased levels of DHT, dihydrotestosterone, are associated or perhaps um, the risk um, and contributor to um, prostate cancer. And then in women who have upregulated 5-alpha reductase activity, we see the same sort of thing. We see male pattern baldness, we see acne and hair where you don't want it on your face, particularly as a woman, and, and more of a PCOS type picture. So this enzyme is definitely increased in metabolic issues and uh, high insulin levels, obesity, et cetera. And um, how do we impact that when we're talking about our patients? What can we do to decrease that enzyme activity? And one of the things that we use quite a bit of in our office is saw palmetto, and most of us are fairly familiar with that. But again, every patient is different, and the typical dose uh, and what the literature supports in my research is about 160 milligrams BID. But again, keep in mind, every patient is different, so your dosing may be different for your patients. Uh, again, stinging nettles works here. EGCG works here. Progesterone is another thing I do. If I'm prescribing hormones to my patients and I'm concerned about increased 5-alpha reductase activity and I'm giving uh, it, testosterone, um, particularly to my male patients, it's not uncommon for me to add some progesterone to their um, compounded prescription um, just to prevent or decrease that, that enzyme activity. Again, as I mentioned earlier, zinc uh, works on decreasing this activity as well. And there's obviously the prescription finasteride that works on this enzyme. Here is a blown up picture of what you would find in the 24-hour urine collection. 
and um, DHT is not something that's measured in urine. It is something that's measured in blood, so that's why you don't see a number here. And um, again, I wanted to point out this activity of the 5-alpha reductase and 5-beta reductase. You can see here's 5-alpha, 5-beta reductase, and you can see these metabolites are quite high. So um, this is a really good test to be able to give you all of these metabolites and information and, and just provide a big picture for you to be able to sit back and take the information that you're learning today and decide what things um, you need to change or add in the management of your patients to be able to impact all of these enzymes and improve all of the uh, abnormalities you're finding uh, clinically as well as on hormone testing. Next, we're going to um, talk about estrogen metabolism, and there's a lot of enzymes involved here, so um, I'm not going to go through all of them exactly, but just to talk a little bit about estrogen. Um, I didn't know this before, but I, I do like that, you know, E1 is estrone, or one at the end of it. E2 is estradiol. You've got that dye for two, if it helps you remember, and then estriol, or tri, is E3. Um, so estrone is the main estrogen that's really made postmenopausally, and it is associated with increased risks of uh, perhaps breast cancer. Uh, there's not really strong evidence on that, but that is what is suggested in the literature. Estradiol has over 400 functions in the body, and it is the most potent estrogen. And estriol is the least powerful, but really provides the most benefit. Um, so getting good balance when you look at all of these metabolites in your patients, uh, particularly if you are prescribing hormones and you're looking at the perimenopausal or postmenopausal woman, it is important to understand uh, all of the uh, metabolites and, and the functions of all of these um, estrogens. So we do want the most efficient metabolism, and the most efficient metabolism is really going to result in more 2-hydroxyestrone and 2-methoxyestrone. Um, the inefficient estrogen metabolism is going to end up with a, leaving you with a predominance of 16-hydroxyestrone and 4-hydroxyestrone. And these really have a negative impact in the body. They do uh, allow oxidation or oxidative stress, and there's definitely damage to the DNA that occurs with more 4-hydroxyestrone. So when we're looking at um, estrogen metabolism, we want to do everything that we can to make sure the metabolism, metabolism is efficient and healthy. And the things that positively inf influence uh, these enzyme activity, these cytochrome P450 enzymes, are um, good healthy things that you would think about, that you're telling your patients already. You want them to have a good healthy exercise regimen. Not too little, definitely not excessive, just enough, and that's different for all patients. Cruciferous vegetables are important here, and cruciferous vegetables are uh, in the brassica family, things like broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts. Um, a pesticide-free diet, a and one that's not genetically modified, good healthy weight loss, not too much, but that they should be at a good healthy weight. Um, and then um, things that are going to impact healthy metabolism are things like diindole methane and uh, indole free carbonyl or I3C. And I3C, um, there's some other really good benefits of I3C. Um, it does induce apoptosis in cancer cells, so that's programmed cell death. It's been shown in the liver and intestinal lining to increase the enzymes responsible for detoxification. And there also is some evidence that it does uh, prevent angiogenesis, so again, having a, a further benefit in decreasing the likelihood of developing cancers. There is definitely some um, benefit shown in breast cancer, although uh, not as much benefit has been shown in some other types of cancers. And there is some concern in the literature that, um, you know, I3C may ha be associated with, with increased other types of cancers. So it's not something you want to just 
blanket and give to every patient you see, but it is something to consider in those patients that are having difficulty metabolizing estrogens properly and in those that may have increased risk of breast cancer. The other things that um, do lead to healthy metabolism of your estrogens are uh, decreasing or staying away from alcohol, soy, and by soy I mean uh, non-genetically modified fermented soy is the best, a high-protein diet versus a high-carbohydrate diet, flaxseed, omega-3 fats, um, and unhealthy metabolism is going to be seen in um, all these other things. And what struck me was that caffeine actually can lead to the conversion of more 16-hydroxyestrone. And so just something to keep in mind for yourself or your patients who are drinking more coffee. Catechol O methyltransferase, this is the enzyme responsible for methylating uh, the uh, hydroxylated estrogens, particularly the carcinogenic ones, the 4-hydroxy estrogen is the one we're going to be more um, concerned with here. But COMT is also associated with uh, um, having metabolism of your catecholamines dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine as well. So a lot of us in clinical practice are doing genetic testing in our offices and looking at things that impact methylation. And methylation is really important for healthy metabolism of your estrogens. So in, in our office, we're looking at um, single nucleotide polymorphisms or genetic variants in MTHFR, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase, as well as COMT. And so um, if you have a genetic variant in COMT and or MTHFR, you are going to impact the way your body methylates and thus um, metabolizes estrogens. So COMT activity is upregulated in things that promote methylation. So SAME, uh, methylated B vitamins, TNG, choline, and methionine, um, you can overmethylate, so I'm not, it's a lecture in and of itself, but um, something to consider in those patients that you see poor methylation. Um, here is a, a, it's a lot of details on this slide here. Here is a, is a picture of what this complete hormone testing, the 24-hour urine collection, actually looks like. And in the, uh, the pie, pie graph over on the right, um, the bottom pie is what the patient should look like. That would be ideal. And you can see in the um, pie up above, you've got uh, less 2-methoxyestrone um, than you should and more 4-hydroxyestrone than you should. Um, and so this would be someone who's not methylating as adequately as you would like them to be, and so you might consider uh, providing additional methylation support. And here's uh, a, a little snippet out of that same 24-hour urine collection. And you can see if you look at the bottom here, you've got the four hydroxy estrogens quite high with uh, you know, very low and non-detectable four methoxy uh, estrogens. And so indicative of uh, inadequate uh, methylation occurring here. So again, this would be someone that you would want to make sure you're supporting methylation. So now that we've gone through almost all of the enzymes involved in this pathway, I'm going to run through a couple of cases and hopefully that will uh, be helpful to show you how you know, I use this in my own clinical practice. So the first case that I have was actually of a 34-year-old male physician patient um, who presented ultimately was diagnosed with Lyme disease. His presenting complaints were dizziness and vertigo. Uh, he was very fatigued. He had no sex drive. He was gaining some weight around the middle. He was really having difficulty sleeping along with his other Lyme symptoms. So he was really wired but tired. He was irritable and he had recurrent infections, lots of upper respiratory type infections. Here are um, some, not all of the blood tests that we did, but his cholesterol was adequate. One of the things, again, that I mentioned earlier, we want to make sure when we're assessing hormones that patients have enough cholesterol to make hormones. Um, I typically don't like to see a cholesterol level below about 150, because then I find that patients do start to struggle to be able to adequately make hormones. 
His estradiol was in the lower third of the reference range, which was really optimal. His estrone, however, was in the upper third of the reference range, which indicated to me that there was uh, increased aromatase activity um, occurring here. Progesterone was on the low end of the range, but within range. He was, uh, you know, he didn't appear to have a pituitary issue. FSH, LH, and prolactin were in range, um, albeit on the low side, but within range. His testosterone, quite low. This is the 34-year-old guy with a testosterone level of 316. And he should really be in the upper half to upper third of that reference range at least. And his free testosterone, uh, you know, both of the testosterone and free testosterone levels were not even in reference range. DHEA as well, very low, not even in range. His sex hormone binding globulin, uh, fortunately, was within range and wasn't too high, so at least he was getting some activity of his hormone levels, uh, hormones in his body. Pregnenolone also, that, that first hormone uh, in this steroid pathway was quite low. I, I like to see my patients' pregnenolone levels around 70 to 100. We did a serum cortisol level, which was quite high initially, and um, and then he was also found to have uh, an MTHFR genetic variant in his 677T, um, nothing in his A1298C, and no COMT SNPs. His other lab tests, other than some inflammatory markers and Western blot were otherwise unremarkable. So here is um, a four-point cortisol uh, test that um, one of the several that Genova provides and offers. Um, and you can see in him, um, if you look at actually the levels, his uh, estradiol was quite low. Estrone was, you know, not comparative to what we saw in serum where he was on the higher end, but in range here, um, estriol low, which we would expect. Testosterone very low for a man of this age. Progesterone level very low, but in range. And then um, if you look at his four-point cortisol level, you see all four points of cortisol were on the higher end, some out, actually outside of range, some within range, but on the high end of range, and very low DHEA. So this is really a great uh, visual example of that cortisol steel that we talked about earlier, otherwise known as progesterone steel or pregnenolone steel. This is a patient whose body was under a tremendous amount of stress, and in order to keep him alive and survive, um, he, his body was preferentially making cortisol at the expense of his androgens. Um, he was also relatively flat on melatonin, and he did explain and, and describe that he had some difficulty with sleep. So what did we do for him? Um, this is how I look at all of my patients, and I told you I would talk a little bit about stress. Stress is um, not just the emotional mental stress, the way we think about it. It is also infectious stress, traumatic stress, oxidative stress. So you know, the body's response to stress is the same, make more cortisol. Um, so for patients that are coming to me, we're always looking at ways to decrease stress, emotional, mental, physical stressors as well. So for him, we uh, worked on breathing exercises, prayer, meditation, all the things that would work on the emotional, mental, while we treated the physical stressors. He had infection, so he, was, he had Lyme disease, and we were working on giving him antimicrobials as well as antifungals. Uh, he also had inflammation. So we gave him an anti-inflammatory diet and put him on some anti-inflammatories like omega-3 fats and curcumin, other anti-inflammatories. But from a hormonal perspective, you know, again, nothing happens in isolation. We're addressing upstream issues, as I just went through. But we also want to uh, impact some of these downstream things that we're finding on hormones. So we did give him pregnenolone. Um, we did initially give him, started with 25 of DHEA. Uh, that did increase to 50 milligrams, which he tolerated well. We actually, because his testosterone levels were so low, we did start with giving him some HCG to try to, um, you know, 
based on his age, try to get his testes to um, be more responsive and make testosterone on their own, that we were not as successful as we would have liked to have been, and we ultimately put him on uh, testosterone with some chrysin. Because of the aromatase activity that we were seeing with the elevated estrone, we added in some green tea or EGCG uh, zinc and recommended that he use flaxseed in his diet. Because of the high stress levels and to um, address the uh, cortisol response, we did recommend these adaptogenic herbs. And we also suggested um, that um, and prescribed some methylation support because of his heterozygous MTHFR. I didn't have written on here, just so you know, he did have a CT and MRI of his brain, which were negative because his complaints were vertigo, and uh, um, we want to make sure there's no uh, intracranial abnormality, and we also recommended melatonin for sleep for him. This next case um, is a 24-year-old female who really presented with what, what really was PCOS. She had irregular periods, facial hair, she was obese, she had a high-carb diet, and this is just a visual. I wanted to give you a few different examples of what you might find on these uh, saliva panels. Very high cortisol levels, very high DHEA, and high testosterone. So again, treatment, when I'm looking at these patients, um, we want to stress reduce. So we have to look at all of the things that are stressors. We look at diet. It's a stressor. She was eating a high-carb diet. So we wanted to go on a low-carb, high-protein, good, healthy fat diet. We needed to work on mental, emotional stressors. It was, you know, address uh, inflammatory issues that were going on. Look for things like infections and oxidative stress and address those. But for her specifically, we did put her on metformin, um, which, again, we talked about it decreasing the 3-beta-hydroxysteroid and 17-beta-hydroxysteroid enzymes, um, thus decreasing the uh, androgen impact on the body. We also recommended adaptogens for her, zinc for the 5-alpha reductase uh, activity that, you know, with the hirsutism that she was experiencing. And spironolactone I use occasionally, not often, but for her acne and uh, issues that she was having is another consideration. And here's my last case. I just wanted to point this out because it's so important to to think about this. This was a 28-year-old male who presented with inflammatory bowel disease and really significant amounts of diarrhea, weight loss, and he had been uh, recommended to be on a BRAT diet, very low-fat diet, because he couldn't tolerate it. His cholesterol was you know, so shockingly low at 118. And I told you that cholesterol is that first building block in the steroid hormone pathway, so you need cholesterol to make hormones. And as you can see on his four-point cortisol uh, test here, he really was relatively flat. His cortisol levels were, were very low. DHEA was low. Um, and testosterone for him was also low. And so, you know, this isn't necessarily a case where you give the patient, um, you know, a ton of hormones. What we needed to do in this particular case is really address the fact that his GI tract was a disaster and he had no uh, cholesterol, no building block to be able to make hormones. So our primary and uh, most important focus was to be on um, treating the gut, which we did with things listed here was uh, probiotics. We gave him glutamine, omega-3 fats, uh, put him on an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, he got some digestive enzymes, and, and he was able to tolerate uh, fat intake better. We did put him on some licorice root, which did help to increase the cortisol. I will make one comment and just caution. Licorice root is associated with hypokalemia, and in patients with significant diarrhea already, you do have to, you know, exercise caution and just make sure you're monitoring electrolytes and, and be concerned uh, with that. We did put him on some pregnenolone and DHEA. Uh, I can happily tell you his cholesterol levels are in the 160s. He's gained weight. He has no GI symptoms whatsoever. A few other things that we added into his regimen, uh, something to consider outside of hormones or, uh, you know, but with patients with inflammatory bowel disease is low-dose naltrexone, and we also added some curcumin in his case and he's doing quite well. So that was so much information to try to get through in a relatively short period of time, um, but I'm hoping, as I stated, that you're walking away with a little bit more uh, confidence in this hormone pathway and a little bit more information to be able to use in your clinical practice. And I'm 
I'm open for any any questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Antoine. That was a great presentation. Um, we have received quite a few um, clinical questions that unfortunately we probably won't have time to get to all of those today, but I'll start out with a few. And then we did receive a question or a few questions about the availability of this presentation. So that should be available within a week um, up on our website. The PowerPoint, PowerPoint will be in PDF form and then you can listen as well. There's also going to be a rebroadcast uh, tomorrow night. Um, so <clears throat> the first question here um, is with regards to methylation. So are there any risks of over methylation? And then how do you assess over methylation versus under methylation? So, good question. Um, yes, you can definitely over-methylate patients. I think it's a topic that's a little bit more challenging to try to get through than in the last few minutes here. But, um, I, you know, it's clinically, how are the patients presenting? If patients are presenting with symptoms of anxiety, um, and you can also look at their catecholamines and look at those metabolites and how that COMT activity is uh, expressing itself, um, you know, one of the things you can do is to try in your patients. You can always stop. And the, the first thing I see in my patients that I do overmethylate, um, you know, if I do ever methylate, is that they start complaining of feeling anxious. So definitely, you know, getting into genetics and, uh, and impacting um, methylation is, you know, something not to be taken lightly. One of the things that I find, especially with MTHFR, and it's a little bit outside the scope, but I have found clinically patients who present with an MTHFR yet a low homocysteine level do not tolerate methylation well because they often have an associated CBS enzyme uh, genetic uh, variant. Um, but those with MTHFR that have high homocysteine levels and or uh, COMT genetic gram, um, but also still have high homocysteine uh, levels, tend to tolerate methylation support um, in low levels. Okay, great, thank you. Um, an another question here, have you seen low sex hormones in patients with long-term statin use? I have seen that. Um, I, you know, it's hard to determine Patients are presenting with a lot of different issues. So by the time they're coming into my office, it's not just the, I, you know, my office is really a consultative practice. So patients are coming in with a lot of concerns and health concerns. And so I do have quite a few patients, obviously, that come in on statins since it's one of the most commonly prescribed medications. So chicken or the egg, uh, when you have low cholesterol levels, um, it certainly is going to impact your ability to make hormones, as we just chatted about, but they may have other reasons for having low hormones, uh, sex hormones as well. So, um, but it's certainly something through, you know, as I mentioned here biochemically, you need cholesterol to make hormones. So for lowering those levels too much, you definitely impact the ability to make those hormones. Right. Thanks. Um, and then there was another question just acknowledging that progesterone starts to drop in the mid-30s in women. Are there natural means to increase progesterone in these patients other than supplementing with bioidentical progesterone? So that's where the chase tree berry may be um, helpful. And the dosing that um, you know I have found is 400 milligrams in the morning. And while we don't necessarily entirely understand how it um, increases progesterone levels, it appears to be through decreasing prolactin levels that it actually improves progesterone levels. So that would be one of the things that I would um, look at. Mm -hmm. Great. And certainly everything you just presented to us too about trying to balance out the pathway and correct yes. any sort of imbalances is going to have a, an impact on the progesterone too, hopefully. Yes, absolutely. Great. All right. So we are at time here. Um, and in the interest of time, we'll have to end the Q&A period there. Um, for those of you out there listening, if you would like some additional educational materials, you can visit our website, www.gdx.net. 
On our site, you can find sample reports, kit instructions, and other information for all of our profiles by clicking on the Clinicians tab at the top of the page, or by logging into your MyGDX account, or by clicking on the Learn Now link on the homepage. Um, after taking advantage of the materials on our website, please feel free to contact client services with your questions. You'll see a number on the slide for US and UK customer service. Additionally, you can call client services if you need assistance in setting up a MyGDX account. We also offer complimentary appointments with our medical education specialists to answer questions related to our testing, which might include choosing the right test for your patient and reviewing patient test results. We'd like to encourage you to look for upcoming webinars on our website. Next month, we have Dr. Aviva Ram speaking on the stress response, women's health, and the role of adaptogens. So thank you again, Dr. Antoine, for a great presentation. And I'd like to thank everybody out there for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Have a great day.